konferencia Sankti Evangelii Tekunim Johane. Tempore, dicti Jesus discipuli sui, si quis diligent me, sermonem meum servabis, e pater meus diligent eum, et ad eum veniemus, et mansionem apud eum faciemus. Qui non diligent me, sermones meos non serva. Et sermonem que maudistis non est meum, sed eius qui misit me patri. Et locutus um bobis, apud vos mahane. Paracritus autem spiritus sanctus, que misit pater in nomine meum. Ile vos docebit omnia, et sugeret vobis omnia que cumque dixero vobis. Pacem relinco vobis, pacem meam do vobis, non comodo mundus dat ego do vobis, non torbetur torbestrum, neque pohor mide, audisis quia ego dixi vobis vado et venio ad vos. Si diligeritis me, Gauderetis utique, quia vado ad patrem, quia pater maior me est. Et nunc dixi vobis prius quam fiat, ut cum factum puerit credati. Iam non multa loquar vobis cum. Venit enim princeps mundi huius, et in me non habet qui hit qua. Serut cognoscat mundus quia diligo patre, et sigur mandatum dedet mici pahate, sic patio. This Sunday, the Archdiocese formally marked the conclusion of our participation on the Synod of Synality. Archbishop Belisario celebrated the morning mass at Our Lady of Guadalupe Cathedral. In recognition of the parishioners' participation throughout the Archdiocese in our winter and spring meetings, he asked that we continue to pray for this process and work of the church. Father's Day Novena envelopes are available in the back of the church. The Father's Day is just two Sundays away. We'll begin the novena on Sunday, Father's Day. Uh, please return your envelopes to the parish office by Friday before Father's Day. And finally, today is Father Dismas's final Sunday here at Holy Family Old Cathedral. It's with great thanksgiving and gratitude for Father Dismas and his ministry and his service here at the parish and around the state of Alaska as well. Father Dismas, I thank you for your presence, your faith, your powerful preaching, sharing the word and God's truth with us and all that you've done in your time here, for your time especially, your attentiveness to our Spanish community and for our Dominican Rite Mass community and for your mission work up in Fairbanks. Once a month, Father Dismas would fly up to Fairbanks to celebrate Mass not only in Latin but also in English. He had the early morning Mass in English in Fairbanks, got back on the plane, and was always back here in time to celebrate the 2 o'clock Spanish Mass and, of course, to be here for the community at 4 o'clock. So, Father Dismas, thank you so much. We are going to miss you, and we hope to see you. We know that we will be seeing you again, but during this time, we ask, we thank you for your service. We ask for your prayers and know that you will be in our prayers as well. Thank you, Father Dismas.
Also, if you still happen to have those uh, little spiritual bouquet cards, please bring them back and give them to Father Andy so we can turn them into the Archbishop. And today's Mass is offered especially for Sarah and Patrick Crowley. And also, we will continue our regularly scheduled Dominican Rite Mass, which will include the, this Wednesday. Father Andy will continue, at least in the interim, until we can get all our priest assignments sorted out. Now, it is said that the human body is essentially renewed every seven years, that after seven years, every cell in your body has been replaced so that you have a new you every seven years. It's a creative trope, but not exactly true, because every different cell has a different, carefully controlled lifespan. Now, some cells will die off, but after a few days. White blood cells will die off after about a year or so. Liver cells, maybe 18 months. Fat cells are reported to live about 10 years, but in my experience, that is definitely fake news. <laughs> but there are even some human cells that will last about as long as you will. The muscle cells of your heart, the inner lens cells of your eye, and even the neurons in your brain. Yet, through all these, we have the same underlying animating spiritual principle of the rational human soul, what we might sometimes ambiguously call life. It is what governs and rules over the body as best that it can. Now, the body simply cannot do as it wishes on its own and prospers. The members of the body cannot go on their own and have the entire body prosper. St. Paul uses that analogy of the human body and the church well in both Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Now, all throughout Holy Week and Easter especially, we have focused in large part on the works of St. John the Evangelist but really centers in great part on the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, especially our Lord telling the apostles how he will send the Holy Spirit upon them. And then from there, we will get the birth of the church. Then we, from that, we get the body of Christ, each member then being governed and maintained by the Holy Spirit as a temple or as a cell of that same spirit which is brought forth from this great feast of Pentecost, the birth of the church. It is this spirit who is immortal and eternal, who is, as we say in the creed, the Lord, the giver of life. It is the same spirit of which we partake of yesterday, today, and forever. And yet throughout history, men and women have risen up offering a new spirit, as they say, a new birth, or a new church that seeks to grow then a new life. But something that seeks to grow for its own sake without being subject to the spirit, or without being subject to the body is, well, simply in biology, a cancer. It drains our resources and it saps our strength of we, the body of Christ. I remember a theologian who was pretty far out there being asked once why she remained in the Catholic Church in spite of all her opinions. And her answer was, because that's where the copy machines are. You have to give her points for honesty. She needed the resources of the body, if not necessarily interested in the well-being of that same body. But really, there is nothing new under the sun, as scripture tells us. Every age seems to raise up someone or some group that believes itself as the true spirit or as the true soul of the church, forgetting that a new body, again, that governs itself independently is really a cancer. It cannot bring forth new life. It can only destroy the old. So as I mentioned, St. John's writings then are very inspirational with the theology profound theology of the Holy Spirit. And so many have risen up claiming that same spiritual mantle. 
In those very early days, St. John's body was barely cold when soon after his death, a movement rose up in Asia Minor called Montanism, named after priest Montanus, who had also two very famous prophetesses, Prisca and Maximilla, who claimed that not simply to be speaking as prophets or speaking even as apostles, but as really as passive mouthpieces of God being almost possessed, as it were, by God. An early church historian wrote about this founder, and he, Montanus, became beside himself. And being suddenly in a sort of frenzy and ecstasy, he raved and began to babble and utter strange things, prophesying in a manner contrary to the constant custom of the church, handed down by tradition from the beginning. So these Montanists claim that the old church, and we're only talking now in the second century, but the old church was carnal then and not spiritual, and that their revelations then as the new prophecy could supersede the teaching of St. Paul, St. John, even that of our Lord himself in the Gospels, and likewise believe in some other novel things like women's ordination. They were, to no surprise then, very averse to doctrine, but quite keen on their own sets of ethics. As I said, nothing new under the sun. Now in the Middle Ages, the closest equivalent rose up with one Joachim of Fiore, who was kind of an odd Cistercian monk, and he came to believe strongly in the idea of patterns, especially the patterns of threes, seeing the three ages of the world as the age of the Father in the Old Testament, the age of the Son in the present church, and then the age of the Holy Spirit in some future coming church, apparently missing that whole part about the Lord ascending and then sending down the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Some of his followers then saw this era of the Holy Spirit being fulfilled in the person of St. Francis of Assisi, who lived roughly around the same time a little later, but this was somehow betrayed then by some Franciscans and the institutional church. They reasoned that since they saw the rule of St. Francis as the gospel, and that the gospel cannot be dispensed from by the Pope, obviously, then it is the Pope who must be in error. Never mind that St. Francis always yielded to the Holy Father, submitted his very rule to the Holy Father for his approval, and was obedient to him. He never saw his rule as a gospel, rather based on the gospel for his followers. He never saw it even as a rule for all, but there we are. So again, these groups saw themselves kind of a being a new Pentecost, a new prophecy, being the fulfillment of all that was promised by St. John about the Spirit and so forth. He's generally being called in their time the spiritual Franciscans. And then, of course, we have that in our own days when Pope St. John XXIII called the Second Vatican Council, he related that it came to him as an inspiration of the Holy Spirit to call this council. But he himself would insist that this was not a new spirit, nor a council somehow differing in degree of inspiration from other ecumenical councils. Some take his prayer for the council then as calling for a new Pentecost and therefore a new church but he himself was extremely careful, asking in his prayer that the Holy Spirit, quote, renew your wonders in our time as though for a new Pentecost. And notice that wording, renew, as though. So then not a true second Pentecost, because that means the death of the church, but it's for an outpouring of that same Holy Spirit in the same church, renewing. Indeed, the idea of the new Pentecost, as he called it, was not for a change in truth or teaching, but a renewal and a new impetus forward for evangelization. In other words, that the effects of the same spirit may be as overpowering and animating as they were in the days of old at Pentecost, not that a new spirit somehow take over and take charge said the same Holy Father, what is needed at the present time is a new enthusiasm, a new joy and serenity of mind 
in the unreserved acceptance by all of the entire Christian faith without forfeiting that accuracy and precision in its presentation which characterized the proceedings of the Council of Trent and the First Vatican Council. So does that sound like a new church or a new spirit? And then continuing the same address to the same council, St. John the 23rd did not decry tradition and doctrine as things to be tossed aside, rather saying that, quote, the voice of the past is both spirited and heartening. Not only did he not say that Christ was now simply one path to God among many, or somehow a new church was needed, but that, quote, the whole of history and life hinges on the person of Jesus Christ. Either men anchor themselves on him and his church and thus enjoy the blessings of light and joy, right order and peace, or they live their lives apart from him. Many positively exclude him, oppose him, and exclude themselves then from the church. The result can only be confusion in their lives, bitterness in their relations with one another, and the savage threat of war. And like St. John the Evangelist or St. Francis, some people could then barely wait until the body of St. John the 23rd was cold before taking up a new and novel spiritual interpretation of what he really meant. No, what he really meant was the same thing that his namesake meant, St. John the Evangelist, who insists throughout his writings that above all, the spirit is not the spirit of his age or our age or any age, but that he is the spirit of truth. And that truth is once and for all revealed fully in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself tells us today in the gospel, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He does not say, if you love me, you will come up with your own commandments as you see fit for your own personal truth. No, Christ says, I am the truth. And the spirit he promises to send the apostles will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. He doesn't say, and come up with new spiritual truths. No, as members of the church, as cells in the body of Christ, each of us come and go, each in our own time. But through it all, through all of history, it is the same underlying, animating Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that has spoken through the prophets, the same Holy Spirit that has spoken through the church, the same Holy Spirit that has given birth to us in Holy Mother Church and will continue to give birth to new souls until the end of days. If you want renewal, if you want a new Pentecost, then you have to take up that same one, holy, catholic, and apostolic church. You have to take up those same spiritual arms as St. John the Evangelist, as St. Francis, and countless saints throughout the ages. And you have to proclaim that same faith, undiluted, unpolluted, unadulterated, with full-throated joy and with fullness of truth. So as the prayer so aptly says, Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle them the fire of your love. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
secula seculorum. Oremus, vecetis salitaribus moniti, et divina institutione formati, ademus dicere, Pater noster, qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum, da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostri, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. Omnia secula seculorum. Ac Domini sit semper vobiscum.
Dominus Vobiscum. Initium Sancti Evangelii Secundum Joanum. In principio erat verum et verum erat apud Deum et Deus erat verum hoc erat in principio apud Deum. Omnia per ipsum facta sunt et sine ipso factum est licit. Quod factum est in ipso vita era vita era lux hominum. Et lux in tenebris lucet et tenebre ea non comprenderunt. Quid homo missus adeo cunomena Ioannes? Hic venit in testimonium, ut testimonium periberet de lumine, ut omnes crerent crirum. Non erat ille lux, per ut testimonium periberet de lumine. Erat lux vera que illuminat onem hominem lientem in huc mundum. In mundo erat et mundus per ipsum factus est, et mundus eum non cogniovit. In propria venit et sui eum non eceperunt. Hoc oratum eceperunt eum de Gisei potestatum filios de fieri, his qui crerunt in nomine eius, qui non est sanguinibus, neque est voluntate carnis, neque est voluntate viris, ex Deo nati sunt. Et verbum caro factum est, et habitabit in nobis, et vidimus gloriam eius, gloriam quasi unigenitia patre, plenum gratiae veritatis. 